Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Honor the Feminine podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Ledford. And today we've got Allison Moon with us, and she is going to bring us some magic. So as you know, we start each episode with a image and story from my travels, because when I was traveling is when I really started to hear my intuition again. When the day-to-day chaos and expectations and noise fell away, I started to hear her whispers. And I know she was always there, but she just got muffled. So today, our image is called Divine Artistry, and it was taken in Jalsamor, India. This is the quintessential divine of the feminine in the container of the sacred masculine. The dance of the two energies is the grandness of life. This is one of the magnificent sites in the golden city of Jalsamor. Each of the large towns in Rajasthan boasts an epic fort that is the product of the warrior clan and feudal lords, the Rajputs. The Raj comes from there. The container of the sacred masculine is seen looming over the town, but the real secret is the way the divine feminine flows through it all. The flow needs structure to feel held in order to be its most powerful self, and the structure needs flow to feel the true essence of life. And this is the image that reminds me of our guest today, Allison Moon. Allison, my love, welcome. Thank you for having me, Shannon. Oh, I'm so excited about this. So <laughs> share yourself with us. Tell us about you. Oh, about me. Um, well... I guess first and foremost, I would say that I am, I would describe myself as a lover. Mm. Um, (laughs) Yes, um, I have been, I'm celebrating my 13 year marriage anniversary next week. And my journey into everything I've experienced, um, my spiritual awakening, and everything I create stems from this relationship with my husband. Um, And ever since I was a little girl, my art, um, my connection to the goddess has, has been fueled by this desire to experience love and romance and an adventure and, um, <laughs> I don't know, just the, the kind of drama of life, right? Um, when I was younger, I um, got really into uh, graphic novels, <laughs> actually Japanese graphic novels. Um, And we call that manga, (laughs) for those of you who don't know much about it. Um, And my first graphic novel was Sailor Moon, and I was obsessed with it. It, The extent that this influenced my life is so enormous, and it's why I go by Allison Moon now. (laughs) It's also why um, my business name is Ms. Moon. Um, But also, the story outlines this, like, really powerful group of women who basically save the world from repeated danger after repeated danger. And the main character is like, she is basically the incarnation of this goddess. And um, she has this beautiful romance with her twin flame counterpart. And I would just carry around pictures of this manga with me everywhere I went in school. And it got me into drawing. I just started drawing the characters over and over and over. And then throughout my young life into high school, um, I could just be seen carrying this huge binder stacked full of papers and drawings and ideas for stories. And that led me into creating my own stories and my own comics and my own graphic novels. And they were totally amateur. It was all fun for me. And it was all about practice. But I was kind of living in this mystical world really outside of everything else and it was a lot in a lot of ways it was my escape because I had a lot of um difficulty with my family at the time my mom was disabled from the time I was really going um coming into my um femalehood right going through puberty um beginning to menstruate and then going into high school probably the most significant time in my life when I really needed a mother the most 
but she had multiple back surgeries and was really not a part of my life for that time. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get to reconnect until I was um, around the age of 17 and I became, um, you know, right into my womanhood. And having that absence of her really impacted me in so many ways, but my art and my mystical world and my kind of, that was my retreat away from all of that pain and all of that suffering. And um, that's what really led me to where I'm at today with my art and with my storytelling and even on my journey treating coloring books, which is something that I'm currently doing. And um, the influence of that on my life and just my relationship now with my husband, we met when we were very young. I was 17. Um, we got married when we were 19. We had our daughter when we were 20, just very young. But I have been, my relationship with him was in such a way that I was able to completely and fully trust in that love. Despite the, the troubles my parents had, um, I was so influenced by Sailor Moon <laughs> and that relationship she had that I believed in love. I believed in it with all my heart. And so I jumped right in and I, I loved, I have the way I even say this. I, I guess I should say that I have Taurus in three of my major signs. So my rising, my sun and my moon are all in Taurus, which is ruled by Venus. So I've got a lot of that like Venus passionate love inside of me. And I feel that really comes out in my art. Um, but it's like, you know, it's just this, this, the way I was able to move into that romance was with a lot of trust and a lot of, you know, just diving it full in. And it surprised a lot of people at the time because I was so young. Um, but, but to this day, I am happily married and he is the love of my life. And I'm so glad that I took that. I, I am so glad that I was able to listen to my intuition and my inner voice and know that that was right for me and not listen to the people who were like, you're too young, you're too this, you're too that, you know. So I trusted in love above all else. And that relationship has really um, influenced everything in my life. And um, the connection that we have and the way that we work together and the teamwork we have just seems to like get more and more beautiful over the years. So. <laughs> oh, that just touches my heart. I mean, that is so gorgeous to step into, I think there, I think there's so much growth and expansion for us in relationships, you know, oh, yeah. and, and in love. And can you speak into some of your new work around the divine union and how it's sort of showing up in your new work and the sacred masculine and divine feminine dancing? Oh, yes. <laughs> so where do I even begin with this one? Um, I, and I don't know, I know we're on, you know, we're kind of in that woo spectrum, right? Um, but I really have this understanding that my husband is like, he is like my mirror. He is like me. He is like the, the, the exact, I don't know how to explain it. You know, some people call it twin flame, the twin flame relationship. Mm -hmm. But we have this experience with each other where um, it's like, he is, I see him and I see him as myself. I see him as my counterpart and my compliment. And so for me, I have this, this really, really, I, I call it a privilege really of being in this relationship where I can be in my feminine and he can be in his masculine and we kind of hold that container together. Right. So that divine union that I've experienced with him really um, the journey into going very deeply into that was last year. And Sorry, this is always kind of brings up a lot of emotion for me. <laughs> um, but we had these, this really deep experience where we meditated together last year and we went into this kind of almost transcendental state where we experienced each other as um, the divine. So I experienced him as the divine masculine. I experienced myself as the divine feminine. And all of our smallness just went away. And it... Wow. and. During that experience, it was like we weren't Allison and Daniel anymore. We were the divine masculine and the divine feminine. And when when everything winded down, it was almost like an initiation that it happened at that time. Um, we were like, how do we get to that all the time, right? <laughs> That's the goal. 
And so my husband and I have always been very attracted to India, to um, Krishna, um, and definitely to Vaishnavism. But at that time, we knew, like, this is our path. And so I redecorated my room. I put up uh, some pictures of the divine lovers. And that is really what we seek to embody with one another. Um, And that relationship is something that I have meditated very deeply on, something I write about on my blog. um, Because I really believe that divine union, at the core of the universe, that is who we are. We are this divine love. It's taking place within our hearts. The goal, I feel like the goal for all of us is when we can merge those two energies within ourselves and experience that divine love within. And then also experience that divine love without, right? Because it's in and it's out and it's everywhere. So... (laughs) I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> oh, it does. You've you've spoken so beautifully because um, I think that there's this way in which we look for this divine union externally outside of mm-hmm. ourselves, mm-hmm. but there's so much power in finding that divine union within and sharing mm. with. And it sounds like you and Daniel have had some experiences where you've been able to dance around both, right? About around having it externally, finding it internally within yourself and bringing it back to really sharing it with each other. Oh, yes. Wow. You managed to just put that so eloquently and exactly describe really what we are seeking to do, like together as a couple on our path together but also individually, right? Oh, this gives me chills. <laughs> yes. So do you two see working together in something magical going forward? Like oh, as, yes. a, as an offering? I love that because, I mean, we've thought about it. We're playing with it right now. Um, one of the things that we're really working on, because, because we do really seek to work with Krishna and that energy. We're part of kind of like bhakti and um, really getting into bhakti. And so we really want to work in that community. Um, And our goal is to really, um, like right now we're working on our yard to kind of create this sacred space, right? This container for doing circle and for doing bhakti circle. And it's something that I, I can see as we evolve, as we grow and transform, that spirit is really guiding us in that direction. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but I definitely see how all of my work and everything that I'm doing is preparing me for that. And I've always felt that, especially when we had this like meditation experience together last year, that that in that moment, I felt the power of our mission together. I felt the power of the, the magic we were weaving on earth. And in that space, everything else just melted away. And all that was there was him. And it's so funny because, like, I have family, I have friends, and I love them so much, right? But it was just so interesting how he was, like, at the center of everything. But I also felt like him embodying that masculine energy, it was really the story that I was really seeing played out is that at the center of everything, that's all there really is, is this beautiful love story. At the center of each of us the center of the entire universe. And that's what my next coloring book is all about. (laughs) That's what inspired me to actually start creating that coloring book. Okay, so you're blowing my mind because this is all (laughs) so gorgeous. And and I love this thing around, it's, it's not just you and him, but it's so much bigger and at the core of each of us, at the core of life and consciousness, it's love. And oh, yeah. So gorgeous. And I also love this idea around the coloring book. Um, because as a, like as a participant in your work, I get to participate in a way that I get to add myself into it. Yeah. Right. And in that way, it feels like it enlivens and activates that in me. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's my goal with it, actually. That's, I think that's the beauty of the coloring books. And I think that's what drew me into it because I, I come in from a space where I was creating, you know, wanting to do graphic novels, right? And, 
and I wasn't really sure, like, what am I doing as an artist? What, what are, what's my viewpoint? How am I really getting my voice out there, right? And then I, I find out adult coloring books are suddenly popular and they're in and people love to color. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so when I first created my first book, um, I was really just filling out the waters, right? It was like, what are people interested in? What can I do? How can I play with this? How, how am I supposed to show up with this modality? You know, like this medium, right? Because coloring is also a very healing act. And they say that it's just as effective as meditation and what it can do for your mind, delivering peace and also kind of like meditation is all about kind of deconstructing belief systems and building new ones. And so I really feel like coloring has that potential to really engage you in that action, but it's so easy. <laughs> it's not like meditate. I know people who are like, I can't meditate it's too hard. I'm like, well, pick up a coloring book. <laughs> yeah, because we're all looking for an access point to better know ourselves. And there, I think there's different oh, yeah. access points at different times for that. And the interesting thing about the adult coloring book craze is that I have been adult coloring for like a dozen years, like a long time. <laughs> when I used to go out and take a new body of work, like out in the world, and I'd come back mm -hmm. and I'd be – choosing which images to bring forth as this um collection from that region i would color i called it color paletting but i would color oh, it would be it was a mandala color book coloring mm -hmm. book and i would color and like the the whatever colors were coming through again and again is what i was picking up in the images for that collection somehow so like it oh. was a really big part of my rhythm with my photography. Yeah. Yes, I love it. That's so beautiful. Yes. Yes to all of it. Yes. It's so wonderful because I think as um, feminine beings, right, we create creativity and the act of doing art, right? It's For me, it comes from a space of devotion, like devotion to myself and devo devotion to my soul and my soul's desire and longing, right, to express. And I really feel very strongly that life itself is an artistic expression of the soul. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a, a performance art, if you will, of the soul. And when I look, actually, when I look at my life that way, it kind of becomes a little less, even in those really boring moments, right? It's like, wow, I'm alive today and I can breathe and I can see and I can smell and I can hear and I can see. And this is, this is exciting expression right at its very definition so to me as an artist and it's actually something I'm working on writing a book about um the artistic expression of life right and how we as feminine beings can incorporate that into our life whether or not we are do describe ourselves as artists right so there's so many ways to, to experience that type of creativity outside of just creating art um but I just think it's so beautiful and I, and art in general and in all its forms. I mean, I just, to me, it's like if I have the pleasure of being in the presence of an artist, whether they're a musician, a dancer, or even if it's just something about the way a person speaks, right? Like a public speaker, I just get so captivated and lost in the art form of it. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope I didn't go too much off on a tangent there. No, I love it. <laughs> The idea of life as art in every moment and that we can bring right. devotion into oh, yes. any moment and th mm -hmm. that makes it more artful, like, that's gorgeous. And it actually brings me back to the Vastu you were talking about, right? To this Vedic knowledge and that. So um, I don't know that we knew this about each other, but um, my spirituality – um, journey is really um, part of a Vedic journey as well, right? So this ancient mm. knowledge that underlies everything. And then oh, the yes. Vastu is the uh, the like ancient architecture. And it's that mm. idea of being in harmony with nature, like building oh, in a way that's in harmony with nature. And when oh, yes. I feel into what you're feeling into with Krishna and creating spaces that feel in harmony for you and Daniel, like mm -hmm. then 
it just creates more of that space to live into the life as art. Oh, yes. Uh, I feel like it's all connected. And when I see those connections, you know, synchronize around me, right, or just manifest in this, these magical moments around me, it, is, it just brings me so much excitement. And it just ties it all together for me. It's like the weaving, right? The weaving of life. Um, but, but that, that, that spirituality that you talk about, um, wow, it has touched me so much. And I would say, really, it was at the center of myself being able to embrace and embody the feminine. Mm. Because I grew up in a very, um, I grew up Mormon and I grew up in this kind of very strict Christian kind of rigidness, right? And even just talking about, Mormons believe in the Divine Mother, but even just talking about her was so taboo. And so it was really difficult for me to transition from, from that mentality and then going into my awakening when my husband and I were around the age of 21, we met our teacher who introduced us to Eastern philosophy and teachings and the goddess. And I felt so much resistance to it, even though I wanted it so badly, even though I had been you know, I read stories about goddesses and that's what inspired me to create my art, even though I myself wrote stories about goddesses, right? Like throughout high school, I remember doing this drawing once and it was so far out there. It was like this priestess, right? It was so far out there. She had all these tattoos there. And one of my, and this is in Reading, you know, the Reading kind of Christian nation kind of, one of my classmates turns around and she looks at the paper and she's like, what is that? <laughs> like, it's so full of like shock. Right. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know what this is. It just came out of me. Right. And so that was like, what was coming through me at the time was these images of these priestess type characters. And as I was doing. And so what characteristics did they have when you're drawing them? I'm just oh, how, do, how do I even explain it? Um, just lots of uh, they would have lots of lots of jewelry tattoos, and then it was the style of the clothing too. It was I don't even know how to describe it. It was just, and then they would have these large crowns on their head, and um, I mean at the time I was really um really not exposed to any of that culture or that ancient wisdom, right? And so. I didn't really know what was coming through me at the time. But now that I reflect back on it, I know what was coming through me. Mm. And so it's really interesting to kind of reflect back on those experiences and see how even then she was with me. And she was always coming through me. And when I look at my art, when I look at the women that I draw, I see how very clearly it's her. There's just no doubt in my mind that that's what's coming through me. And that I've always been connected to her and that she emerged from me, really, she emerged from me right when I started menstruating. So that was a really interesting reflection to have. Gorgeous. We're going to take a sacred pause right here because I'd like to invite you to our sacred space over on Facebook at Honor the Feminine Daily. This month in December, if you're listening live, I am doing a December daily where I'm live in that group every day in December. I'm answering questions from our community. Um, I'm talking about the brilliant allies that joined me on my path in 2017 and highlighting some of them. There are eight of them through the month of December. And then we're going to do a video series in January in that group uh, with those brilliant allies. And that has been really fun. So instead of doing the best gift giving guide for 2017, when I reflected back, it was really the brilliant allies that created the biggest gifts for me this year on my path. And also, we are going to be rejigging the podcast because I've had so much growth and expansion that we're going to feel into some, some bigger ways in which I now honor the feminine. And so we're going to take a small break between mid-December and the end of January, and you'll be able to feel all the behind the scenes of that in the Honor the Feminine Daily Facebook group. So come join our community over there. All right, back to the show. So can you share with us how you honor the feminine and stay in touch with your intuition? Yes. 
I was thinking a lot about this because I am a fan of your podcast and I listen to it. <laughs> um, and every time I love to listen to the answers that come through when people talk about this. But for me, I honor her the most when I embody her. And what I mean by that is there's a way we can approach the goddess in which we're just kind of coming to her at our convenience, right? When we want her gifts. And my mentor, my current mentor said something really powerful to me. She said, that's the definition of exploitation. Basically, when you're just coming to something to get something, right? So when we embody her, that's when we're really honoring her. And to me, that means becoming her in every moment and moving with the cycles of nature, the ebb and flow, speaking softly and tenderly and having the courage to really bring gentleness and softness into a world where there are so many hard spaces. And it means being expressive and creative. And this is, I think, probably the most important part of it, surrendering submissively to the sacred masculine energy to kind of take care of me and allow that sacred container to be held for my feminine, right? Because the feminine needs the masculine for that. That's how she becomes alive in the world, is through that. And I do this in a way that where it's devotional and not just, not just when it suits me. Um, and most importantly, as I said, I think it's most important to do that when we find ourselves in hard spaces. Because it's so easy in those hard spaces to just forget her and to just go straight into kind of like hard, hardened shell, life is hard kind of mode, right? Where we lose that surrender and we lose that serenity that comes through embodying her. And so that's how I really, um, really honor her. Yeah. That is so gorgeous. Like it's just, oh. and it allows for this embodiment of her in every moment. Yes. yes. And I love every time I listen to you speak on it, I'm just like in love. I'm like, oh, Shannon, you, you are a soul sister. Um, because I love how you talk about the, the, when, when we are working with the sacred masculine as women who identify with being feminine, right? identify with the goddess and, and we're seeking to embody her. What we're seeing the masculine as within ourselves is that container to hold us. We see all the ways in our lives in which that that masculine, sacred masculine energy is holding space for us to be that. And I think that's what's really important to understand when we're talking about working with both of those energies as women, right? Because if we were seeking to embody the masculine, I think that would look a lot different. But what we're seeking to do is embody the feminine and allow the masculine to hold space for it. And I see it as I'm embodying the feminine and I'm in a loving, a love, a love intimate relationship, like a romantic relationship with the divine masculine, right? And I'm seeing how, to me, it's really beautiful because it's seeing all the ways in which as, as my consort, right? He is taking care of me and being sweet and tender to me to allow me to be that. That's kind of how I look at it. And that's, again, going with the divine romance, which to me, I just feel like that's what life is all about. That's where what everything stems from. All of creation stems from that. And so I really just feel the most at peace and the most in love with everything when I approach my life that way. Gosh, yeah. as you speak into it, I can actually feel some ways in which I can surrender more to the sacred masculine. Right? <laughs> like, isn't yeah. that beautiful? And that there was a time not that long ago that the idea of mm -hmm. surrendering in particular to the masculine felt yes. extremely, like basically stupid. Right? <laughs> like, yes. that would be an absolutely stupid thing to do. But that was that wounded masculine that swirls around us versus the sacred masculine and me understanding my feminine and the embodiment of it more. And so oh, one yeah. of the ways in which it's been showing up for me 
that um, resonated when you were speaking into it is I'm a warrior. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and one of my old stories is around in order for people to perceive me as powerful and take me seriously, I have to stand in my fierce warrior and show them all the time. Right? Mm. That's extremely depleting energetically. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to mention the irony in it all is as I soften into my warrior, it's actually more powerful. Mm. Yes, I love that. That's beautiful. And I... You know, I practice Kundalini Yoga. That has been a huge system for me and really working into the core of my pain and work and transforming it. Because I don't want to sit here and tell you that my life has been like, oh, lovey-dovey, everything's perfect all the time. It wasn't like that. And there were many moments in my relationship where I thought it would fail. But it was that perseverance and it was really Kundalini Yoga that moved me through and out of all of that. And my husband, too, as together. And it is very much like a warrior yoga. And warrior in the way that we see ourselves as warriors of love, right? It's like being a warrior to me is all about devotion. It's that you are devoted to bringing about whatever is your goal, right? It's like the traditionally the warrior is fighting in a war, right? And they're their goal is to beat the other side, right? But our goal is to bring about this beautiful wave of energy. And to me, that's feminine energy. It's, it's bringing about the divine feminine in, in this world that desperately needs it right now. So we're warriors of love. Like, that's how I see it. And and, and in Kundalini Yoga, they, they, they definitely see it that way. And it's all about, like, they call it the path of the warrior. And I just think it's kind of funny to the synchronicity there and what you're saying. Um, Yeah. Kundalini feels like it's waking up the divine essence and like stoking that fire within, not so that you can use it to burn people, but so that you can burn brighter in, in your truth. And then that gives, I mean, like I've just had this realization that there's times when I dim myself down in order for this person or that person to not feel bad about themselves in some way that that'll that like, if I dim down, then they'll have, they'll have space to shine. And what I'm yeah. learning is that it actually, just like the, the softness creates more power. My burning bright just gives permission for everyone around me to burn brighter. Yeah. Yeah. I also think on that note, on exactly what you're saying, that it burns away falsehood. So anything that's not true about yourself internally burns away. So I haven't really like gained anything really. I've just become more of myself and I feel more. The, this is what I love. So it's in, in, in this uh, tradition, Kundalini Yoga, they call it Wahe Guru, right? Which is the incredible ecstasy of moving from darkness to light. It's that ecstasy of witness, witnessing yourself transform. It's that ecstasy of self-realization, of coming into the realization of who you are. So when I realized myself as this embodiment of the goddess, right, that, I'm going to get emotional over this, (laughs) that to me was the most pivotal moment of my life. And it was also the most, the, the moment of myself where I felt the most like myself, the most like myself. And that everything else I was trying to be was the lie. And that's what that's what honoring the feminine has done for me. Oh, on that note, my love, because that was gorgeous. And so like that drops right in. Um, <laughs> are you ready for the random questions? Yes. <laughs> okay. So be, she's a podcast listener, y'all. So she knows what's coming. <laughs> So if you could sit down with any woman, alive or dead, for a chat and tea, who would it be? I was seriously, I was like, really thinking hard about this question. And this, maybe this is going to sound very simplistic to some, 
But I have this friend I've been chatting with for the course of maybe eight months on the internet, and she lives far away. I have not had the pleasure of being in her presence yet. And it is the most intimate connection I've ever had with another sister. Mm. And for the first time in my life, I feel like I have a, a really a best friend. So I would love to meet her in person. I love that. No, I think that's gorgeous. And I think it also speaks to um, what a beautiful time we live in that we can have these deep connections, even virtually, knowing that being in person would just deepen it even more. Like, I love meeting a sister in person, right? Like, I love it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we can all connect virtually just opens up space for us to drop in together. And I think, I think that's so beautiful. Oh, (laughs) Yeah, I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give any, uh, drop any famous names here. But, (laughs) but yeah, she is someone who I definitely want to see and be with and and just wrap my arms around her and be like, "Ah, full sister, you know. Oh, so good. (laughs) And the second question is, where would you most like to travel? Well, as as a lover of Krishna and Radha, I definitely want to go to Vrindavan, India. Kind of like my dream. Um, I don't even know when or if that will ever. I'm sure it will at some point, but um, yeah, I know a lot of people say India, but <laughs> but this one for me is very. It's very devotional, and it's very. Um, it's almost to me, it would be like a pilgrimage. Yeah. So. I can feel it. It's like a pilgrimage and a coming home and remembering all in one. Oh, yeah. You know, whenever I listen to devotional music, the Bhakti music, there's it stirs this part of me that just feels so ancient and primordial. Like, I'm, I don't know. I don't, I don't have memories, but I feel like I have memories, right? And it's just, it's so beautiful. Well, I love the idea that all knowledge actually resides within us and that we're just remembering and we're enlivening and activating that in each other. Like, that's what we do. I love it, Shannon. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So tell us, my love, how do we reach out and connect with you? How do we get more Alice and Moon in our lives? (laughs) Well, I think I'm most active on Facebook. Um, So my Facebook page, uh, really my profile page, Alice and Moon, um, I don't know the exact URL, but I think it will be in the show notes. Yep. Um, I also have a website, www.msmoon.com. So it's msmoon.com. Really easy to remember. Um, where I have all of my art. You can view all of my beautiful feminine um, art. And you can sign up for our newsletter. And I send out blogs. And I'm gonna, I have some really exciting things coming up. Um, I'm starting a comic strip called um problems of a star girl which i'm really excited for and i finally taking on that dream of being a comic artist and i have coloring books coming out this fall cosmic wonders and i'm really starting to dive more into the idea of being a published writer too so a lot a lot is up for me in my journey in the future so if you come and sign up for the newsletter you'll be able to follow along my journey And I will put all of this in the show notes for this episode over at honorthefeminine.com so you can really easily drop in with Allison. And if you haven't seen Alice, Allison's artwork, it is just, it's so infused with the love that she spoke into today that I invite you to go and drop into that because it's, oh, it's so fun. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. My love, thank you for today. Yes, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be with you, Shannon. Hello again, everyone. It was so lovely to be with Allison and to feel into how she is a lover and that her connection to the goddess has been fueled by her desire to experience love. And if you haven't had the chance to drop in with her artwork over at Ms. Moon, it's amazing. It's it's so it always touches my my heart. And so I invite you to really drop in. Her new coloring book, Cosmic Wonders, is really fantastic and would make a brilliant holiday gift if you're listening to this live in December. 
You can get all the details and the links for that over at our website for the, in the show notes for this episode at honorthefeminine.com. As I mentioned, I invite you to join our community on Facebook at Honor the Feminine Daily. I am going live every day in December, and we're doing a lot of really amazing behind-the-scenes stuff in our community as I uh, rebrand and and bring myself more fully as I am aligned right now into the podcast in the coming year in 2018. And finally, if you love this episode, I invite you to share it with a friend. We will also be back at the end of January Uh, with some amazing episodes, starting with our second anniversary episode on January 31st. So subscribe so you don't miss anything. All right. Have a gorgeous holiday season and a beautiful day. Mm